I'm very happy that in the Spagat lecture series, so the speech acts in, in our grammar and discourse series, we have Mikhail Kissin. Uh, Mikhail Kissin uh, is a professor of linguistics at the Université Libre de Bruxelles. Uh, and in his work, he combines theoretical research with empirical research with particular attention, at least in the more recent years, to differences between speakers, uh, which I think is hugely important. And we at uh, the Leibniz uh, Center in General Linguistics consider uh, as something we really would like to become more expert in. So your talk is very important, not only for our, our own project here. And um, uh, in particular, he works, as we see uh, with his um, uh, screen here on autism. He is a uh, director of this lab, Autism in Context Theory and Experiment at the University of Brussels. Um, uh, Mikhail has a degree uh, or degrees from the University of Cambridge and in particular from the uh, University of Brussels in 2007, I think. He's been to the uh, Institute Nicot in, uh, in Paris and is professor in Brussels since 2012 and full professor uh, since 2021, I think. Uh, now, he is important for our topic, Speech Acts, because he's done highly interesting, deep and broad work on many aspects of Speech Acts. I uh, uh, would like to mention his two books from utterances to uh, Speech Acts um, in 2013 and with Mark Jerry, his book on imperatives, um, both at Cambridge University Press. And there are also numerous articles uh, on specific aspects, on broader aspects, overview articles that are highly uh, informative. Uh, today, he will, um, uh, Mikhail will talk about processing indirect versus non-literal speech acts, insights from autism. And in the abstract of his talk, which I will not repeat here, I was sort of reminded of the character Sheldon in the American sitcom, The Big Bang Theory. I actually used film clips of that uh, in my pragmatics class uh, to show sort of non-ability of understanding indirect aspects of speech acts. Now, this is the Hollywood version, but today I think we will hear about real research uh, on different kinds of people and how they process literal and non literal speech acts and thank you so much and th thank you so much first of all for inviting me and then for this uh kind and too generous introduction it's um I, I i i did i was i did a lot of theoretical work well i tried to on speech acts like at the beginning of my career and it's true that now i moved more uh towards more experimental research and more more uh, focused on autism research. Um, I do hope that you'll find this relevant and uh, perhaps interesting um, because I, I still think that there is there is more, much to learn from experimental uh, research and from autism for our theories of pragmatics. And um, uh, so what I will do today is 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 trying first to share my yeah um to is 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 really something really really simple minded okay so um so so really the, the there won't be any kind of uh, major theoretical uh conclusions it's just some some experimental evidence uh about you know two contrasts uh between very 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 classic examples of what indirect can be. And the first is what's classically called indirect speech acts when you have a mismatch between, uh, between force and the prototypical sentence type, right? It's the, the classic example is, is it possible to open the door? Or it's too cold here asking uh, you actually to open the window. So these indirect speech acts, um, especially when they, they, they don't involve any kind of conventional form such as could you or would you, etc. They usually build as the example where understanding the speech act performed requires grasping the speaker's intention. And a classic examples where 
you know, you need some pragmatics, you need something, some perspective taking, something like that. And you'll see today, I won't be talking about theory of mind because I don't think it's a really clear concept, at least it's not for me, but something like accessing the speaker's perspective. And Manfred mentioned, uh, mentioned earlier uh, popular uh, shows uh, portraying autistic people, and usually it's really kind of, it is portrayed as one thing that autistic people cannot do. And my question is, uh, okay, so how is this different from non-literal speech acts and generally non-literal speech acts in here? Um, I have in mind things like sarcasm, where you have a real mismatch between what's the, the, the encoded content and what's really communicated. And I think that asking this question may actually make us think uh, about what we understand by pragmatic processing really. So I'll be mostly, but not exclusively, using um, data uh, from my team, uh, uh, from uh, autistic uh, individuals, um, uh, adults and children. So just briefly a reminder what it is. So autism is a neuro, neurodevelopmental condition. Um, the um, uh, estimates vary widely, uh, but I think a reasonable estimate currently is one child over 70. There are recent, recent estimates now uh, that put the, the number much higher, but that means like uh, one child over 70 probably has one, type of autism is somewhere on the spectrum. Um, and that's important. There is a great heterogeneity in autism, but in general, autism is characterized by a combination of uh, two main characteristics, stereotypical and repetitive behavioral and or specific interest. Um, I don't usually people speak sometimes about restricted interest. I don't think it's fair because you have People could be interested in string theory. I don't think it's restricted, but it's really, it could be really specific. And what's more important for us today, marked difficulties in verbal or nonverbal social interactions. Now, across the lifespan, um, there are difficulties. Uh, autistic individuals have difficulties grasping the perspective of conversational partners. There, there is some argument here about whether uh, whether uh, it is it is only non-autistic uh, partners they have difficulties uh, interacting with or not. I, actually, I'm not sure that this is the case, but it's it's a topic for either discussion or or another talk. But anyhow, even even autistic individuals who are who have linguistic abilities within the typical ranges have difficulties uh, in uh, those aspects of verbal interaction, or linguistic interaction, where you need to grasp, really grasp the perspective of uh, converse, uh, your conversational interaction with partner. Um, when you look at the, uh, at the um, uh, diagnostic criteria, uh, and today we'll be mostly, uh, uh, we'll, we'll be discussing mostly about uh, autistic individuals who are on the verbal end of the spectrum, um, what you see, sorry, uh, what you see uh, here, you should have an animation, which I don't have, but what, I, what I'd like you to look at is this point four, right? Um, the diagnostic criteria uh, include some really broad, pragmatic dysfunction, disabilities, it's 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 termed differently in different places, but basically you see that this 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 definition, which has clear nosological uh, implication, lumps together everything that's not explicitly stated, making inferences and non-literal ambiguous meanings of language, humor, metaphor, multiple meanings that depend on the context of interpretation. So this definition kind of implies that. Uh, in autism, you have difficulties with everything that's not literal. So that's not true, obviously, but, but uh, we'll, we'll get to that now. Um, I, I, and and uh, by the way, of course, it's really important also to, to, to do research on less verbal uh, individuals on the spectrum, which we try to do in our lab, but 
this won't be much of the talk today. So basically, you see that this, this uh, definition, this, this fourth point, it's basically, um, it basically rests or presupposes a kind of what could be called a really traditional post gricean view. And uh, it's something like, you know, you, 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 you find it that much in, 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 in still in psychological literature. Basically, the idea is that every Thing that's pragmatic requires complex mind reading to get from the literal, literal encoded meaning to different types of meaning. And this includes a referential res resolution, loose speech, metaphor, indirect speech, act, scale implicatures, or other kinds of implicatures, irony, etc., etc. And today I'll be um, concerned with indirect speech acts and irony. Uh, we've done some work on implicatures too, too but that's another topic. Um, so the idea basically is that because indirect speech acts and irony and every, everything like that require uh, grasping the speaker's perspective, autistic people have uh, difficulties uh, understanding indirect speech acts. So, uh, and you do, you, you, by the way, you do find this uh, all over the places in, in, in textbooks and, 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 and introductions, uh, et cetera. So, um, where does the, this evidence comes from? So it's it's often, it has less so now, but it has often been said that indirect requests are not understood by uh, autistic uh, individuals and in particular children. Um, so these studies <laughs> that, 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 that show, that, 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 that put forth these kind of conclusions usually uh, rely what, on what I think are not really good, uh, well, not really appropriate experimental methods to reach these kind of conclusions. So first of all, sometimes the tasks are not really ecological. For instance, this um, really it, it, it widely decided paper by Paul and Cohen, it's, it's quite old. So, so you know, uh, things have changed now, uh, uh, but, but it's still widely, widely, widely quoted. So what they did, they, they basically used different forms um, asking children to to color different drawings. So for instance, I would say, please, could you color this house in, in, in red? Or things like, uh, don't the, the, the roof of this house need to be colored in blue? And what they concluded is that autistic children wouldn't comply much with really indirect uh, forms. Um, well, actually, the forms they wouldn't comply with uh, really were really, really complex things like wouldn't wouldn't you think that that the roof of this 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 house needs to be colored in blue? Um, actually, even neurotypical adults have trouble with this kind of forms. And, and and then the thing is that if you ever you know you ever done this kind of activity with an autistic kid or even a neurotypical kid. Uh, you know, sometimes they have a really clear idea of why, you know, how they should color things. And the fact that they don't change their mind because they, you ask them to, doesn't mean they haven't understood that you were requesting something. The other, uh, the other method that, that's really often used and is still really often used in experimental uh, uh, research on language and in pragmatics is uh, that of metalinguistic judgments. And this is what my case showed it, but you find these methods of, in, in, in other studies too. So basically you, you present vignettes, stories, and the end of the story, you have one protagonist that, that performs an indirect speech act saying, okay, uh, shouldn't you clean your room? And then you ask the participants what, uh, what the, 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 the protagonist meant and why did, did, did they say what they said? And what Mike shall find, and uh, there are also uh, other papers doing that, uh, for instance, by Ozanoff and colleagues, that autistic children have trouble really describing appropriately why the protagonist would say this. But again, what you're asking there is uh, participants to provide metalinguistic judgments. You don't really test the comprehension of indirect requests. Um, so uh, this was, um, um, yeah, now I see there is a, a typo in the title of this slide. Sorry about that. This was um, uh, my very first um, experimental study on autism, um, uh, which I still did as a postdoc. And 
I was kind of dissatisfied about the literature and I also wanted to really know how, you know, what, what the autism world was. And I spent a lot of time in, in one institution, well, in several institutions actually, uh, but uh, I collected this data in one institution. Um, so in this institution, you had autistic kids uh, uh, between uh, five and nine, and they had intellectual language delays, right? And what, what I did is I, I basically filmed for quite a long time, and, and I, I had friends who were doing a movie about these kids at, at, at the same time. So we, they were really used to us. They didn't see the camera anymore. Uh, uh, we went there like once a week for two years. So uh, they knew us. And then uh, uh, we coded the, uh, the, the, the videos um, and we coded them for every time we saw that there was a request performed by adults, but we also coded the, the form of the request, whether it was in plain imperative or an interrogative sentence, something like, uh, 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 would you sit down now? This was in French. So um, in French, what we, we excluded like really, really conventional uh, indirect request or we excluded interrogative with please. So basically these were syntactically declarative sentences with, with a rising pattern, uh, a rising intonation in the end. Declaratives, things like um, uh, your coat should be on hanging on the on the hook, or uh, we we put our scars on when we go outside, things like that. And nominal, so these were basically NPs, so meaning like your things like your coat, your bottle, uh, your seat, meaning sit down or take your coat. And we also coded whether these were complied or not. And what you can see is that, uh, well, they actually comply a lot, but also there is no interaction between compliance and the sentence type. So these kids would comply with any kind of request, whether it has been cast in, as indirect or not. And uh, and, and the proportion of, of, of different uh, uh, types of requests was really comparable. So when we published that, people said, yeah, but perhaps, you know what, they don't really understand indirect requests, they just grasp a word and then they kind of, uh, you know, they, they, they hear code, so they, 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 they put the code. So they don't really understand, uh, they, they don't really grasp the indirect meaning associated with a sentence type. So then we did this, uh, uh, um, Mr. Potato had study and these results have been replicated recently by, um, uh, uh, Marikini and uh, somebody else and Domineski, and it's a paper published in Cognitive Science a couple of years ago. So basically the idea was the following. So the kids were playing with, with different um, Mr. Potatoes. We, we knew that they, 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 they like this, uh, this kind of play. And you had three Mr. Potatoes and 90 different items you could put on Mr. Potatoes head. And you had two, always two experimenters. One was playing with the child. Both were familiar uh, to, to the child, but one was playing with the child and another one was ostensibly not interacting with the child. He was sitting his back, uh, well, their back to the child and reading a magazine. And at some point in the first context, this is what you see here, context one, uh, the first experimenter said, oh, he has no hat. And this was uh, always uh, uttered when uh, the Mr. Potato head didn't have a hat, right? And in that context, it's clearly kind of a suggestion to put a hat on the Mr. Potato. Here you see the results only from a, um, the autistic group. Uh, all kids at that point, autistic kids, put uh, choose a hat and put it on the Mr. Potato head. And then they, they kept on playing. They, 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 they started playing with the second Mr. Potato head. And at, at some point there was a signal. And at some point when when this Mr. Potato Head didn't have a hat yet. The other experimenter who wasn't interacting with the child just said, oh, he has no hat. And that was uh, a comment. There was a picture in the magazine uh, they were reading. Uh, so this was a comment. Now, the, reason, the rationale here was that if children who interpreted in the first context, he has no hat as a request or a suggestion, and did so just because they heard the word hat and did not pay attention to, you know, to the preferred interpretation, you should see hesitation uh, 
in the second context too, in autistic kids. And you didn't. Basically, they didn't even look at the hats or didn't try to look in the object towards the hats. Some of them even got up and said, oh, who has no hat, etc." So this kind of suggests that, and these were young children with autism who, uh, who had a language delays again, and uh, uh, not a huge sample, but at that time it was more difficult than now. Um, so uh, this kind of suggests that it's not impossible for these kids, they are not overly literal, and it's not impossible to grasp the intended force of a sentence, uh, even though uh, the force is not prototypically associated with uh, the sentence stack. And then um, we wanted to do this with adults and try to see, to try to, to, to investigate this um, with, with, uh, in a more controlled way. And here, um, uh, we, we tried this task. It has been done with uh, neurotypical first. Um, so the task was the following. It was an act out task. Again, I think, uh, as already said, I think it's really important to see what people do rather than what they think that other people say, right? So people were uh, presented with a touch screen and in this touch screen, you had geometrical shapes in a grid in two buttons, yes and no. And again, it was in French and they had headphones uh, and they had instructions uh, they had to comply with. Um, the first kind of instruction was a completely in an ambiguous request. It was an imperative, something like move the right red triangle to the right of the green square. And they had to move, so these shapes moved, so you could like drag and drop them uh, in the grid. The second type of, of in instruction you heard was uh, in an ambiguous question. Is the red triangle on the right of the green square? And you had to click on yes or no, right? The two other uh, instructions were uh, in ambiguous. They were indirect speech acts. So you, well, they could be interpreted as indirect speech acts. You had a conventional, it was in French again, you had a conventional form. Can you move the red triangle to the right of the green square? You could either answer, yes, or just do it, right? And the other form was completely not, so this, this is equivalent of something like in French is, is kind of a conventional uh, form for indirect request. But the, the fourth instruction was something like, is it possible to move the red triangle to the right of the green square? And that we checked beforehand is not something like conventionally incorporized, conventionally associated with request in French. So again, you could interpret this as a request, move the shape, or you could just uh, answer uh, yes. Uh, now, what are the, um, the, the results? First of all, what you see, so basically what you see here is uh, in gray is people, is the, the, the proportion of responses when people uh, interpreted uh, the is it possible, can you sentence as indirect request when they, uh, when they move the shape, right? And in light gray is when they interpret as a question, they just said yes or no. Uh, as you can see, autistic people were half and half. They didn't overly uh, interpret these, these, uh, these uh, requests, well, these, these interrogative sentences as request more than, than, than us questions, but not other way around either. The, the neuro, it's interesting that what sig it, this was statistically significant is that neurotypical participants actually interpreted the non-conventional uh, uh, form more often as a, as a request, but it's not, it wasn't a huge effect either. Um, another thing that's interesting is that this was uh, done in a, and a screen equipped with an eye tracker, and uh, sorry, and um, we we also wanted to see, and this is the the, the figure you see here, the figure four, when people in, did interpret, can you or is it possible as um, as um, a um, um, as as a request? Did they hesitate? Did they look first as yes or no? Should I first 
first look at this. Was it a question? No, is it, it, it is uh, a request. I should move the shape. So the idea was that if even so, when people reacted to these interrogative prompts by moving the shapes, if would they hesitate first and look at the the yes no buttons that would correspond more to the interrogative um, to to the question interpretation? And long story short, they never did. So basically, when if if you interpret, uh, can you or is it possible? As a request, if you do, if you move the shape, you don't look first at the yes no buttons, and the reaction times uh, were uh, comparable. It's nothing. It's 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 not that interesting. So basically, autistic and non-autistic adults alike, when they interpret, first of all, autistic and non-autistic alike often interpret even non-conventional requests as indirect requests as requests. And when they, they do that, they don't seem to hesitate between the two interpretations. Now, in this paper, we contrasted uh, uh, the interpretation of indirect request, the comprehension of indirect request in autistic adults with um, the uh, interpretation of genuine non-literal speech acts of sarcasm, of irony. Um, uh, this is a, an interesting methodological point, actually. I, I think um, some, some authors uh, did find that, or did claim that actually the comprehension of irony is, 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 is preserved in autism. Um, and this is a paradigm uh, Coralie Chevalier and, and, and colleagues used, uh, so Coalition and all used. Um, so again, um, I think there is a methodological caveat here. What people do in this kind of paradigm, they present a cover story, uh, something like Glenn tells Phil that he decided to come by plane rather by train, and Ben says, and then you hear an utterance, and either it's 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 interpreted with 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 a neutral intonation or with a really really marked intonation, something like "Who? Oh, how clever of you!" Or, right? And you have to choose whether it's admiration or whether Ben thinks that that it's silly. And and in this kind of task, autistic adults are well above chance. Uh, but uh, you can you, you actually see my notes here. It's from an old talk, but anyway, uh, uh, the thing is that first of all, it's basically you have a forced choice, and you have to to, to detect incongruence. And also, most of autistic adults have uh, had some kind of training or intervention or counseling, and in most in most of these kind of programs. One thing that that it's taught is what irony is, why people are ironic, and what what the form of this instruction is. Sometimes people are ironic; they don't mean what they say. They would often use uh, a marked intonation. So, if you really want to, uh, if you really want to to test irony comprehension, what you need is not associate irony with a marked intonation and, and no, no irony with, with an unmarked intonation. You actually have to vary intonation and uh, between different items. You can you can see this video here because, oh, perhaps you can. So this was the screen that the participants saw and we had different types of items. Uh, either the intonation was neutral or marked, but it could be Ironic, the the, the 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 speaker could be ironic, or he could literally mean what he says. He really likes tea, or he really likes milk, or he could be literally saying he doesn't like anything. Something he really doesn't like tea. He really doesn't like milk. And we also did the same thing with facial expressions. So he could be, he could have a neutral ex expression or a marked uh, facial expression, either ironic or literal or re re literal refused. And also we, we manipulated whether the participant knew beforehand what the speaker preferences were. So the task of participants was to decide what the speaker really wants. There were always two items here, tea or milk. So in this case, 
Tu sais à quel point j'adore le thé au petit déjeuner. So she first asked him, what do you want? And he says, oh yeah, you know how much I love tea at breakfast. You had, you had to decide, sorry, what he did, he really did, liked. I don't know what I did here. Okay. Um, and we actually need uh, professional actors for this because it proved really difficult to combine uh, marked intonation with neutral facial expression, vice versa. But we had all combinations. So here, it's the same participants I showed you here with, with indirect speech acts. Here, what happened is these are accuracy um, uh, um, uh, uh, um, figures. Uh, what you see is basically autistic uh, adults were below a chance for ironic items. And prosody didn't help them. Facial expression didn't help them. Actually, it made things more difficult. The only thing that helped them uh, was um, the items where they knew that this speaker ju just said that he doesn't like tea and he said, yes, I like tea. So there they were kind of, they, they, they were more accurate. Um, so what's interesting in this contrast, I think, is that there are selective difficulties, I think, in pragmatics. So because in this task, you really have to shift. You really have to, 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 uh, to, uh, to understand what the speaker wants. Uh, and with indirect requests, you don't always need to do that. Um, and that also means that some pragmatic tasks are perfectly manageable without perspective shift, shifting, like indirect, uh, indirect request uh, or indirect speech acts in general. Again, I don't have nothing, I have, have nothing to say about theory of mind. I don't know how things fit in with, with this. Um, uh, because I'm kind of, I don't have mo much time, I'll, I'll skip. The, they have more evidence uh, for this that autistic adults uh, find different ways to perform uh, tasks such as strategic, stra strategic deception, um, where they don't use perspective taking. And we, we also have uh, the same kind of evidence for uh, autistic kids with selective trust. Um, I can discuss that uh, during discussion, uh, during question time, if someone is interested. But uh, before concluding, uh, uh, there is one, 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 one thing I, sh I would like to, to discuss, uh, um, and it, it's the following. So basically what I've been presenting now, it's something that I've been, uh, I have been uh, defending, but many other people have actually have this kind of typology of pragmatic processing. Some processes uh, require perspective taking, like irony, deception, and some don't, right? For instance, loose speech metaphors, some people say, uh, um, General, generalized implicatures, indirect speech acts, etc. So basically, you map types of pragmatic processes on types of pragmatic meanings or something like that, or figures of speech or something like that. And actually, I don't think it's it's actually a good way to 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 do this. Um, and. Uh, I just want to discuss uh, the same the same ex data, the same experiment, but we did it um, also with neurotypicals. And um, in this paper where we, we, we did it with neurotypicals, we found uh, a really interesting contrast, which I think could be relevant for the for this discussion. So basically, so it's exactly the same the same uh, the same uh, setup. And actually, you might have asked, okay, but how do you know that intonation is ironic or how do you know that facial expression is ironic? Actually, we first pretested this. So we did it online and we, for one group of participants, we just put the, the sentences with no context, no, no videos, and they had to rate it on a Likert scale uh, about how ironic it sounded. And we did the same thing with facial expressions. So we just put the videos, facial expressions, uh, no sound, no context, and they had to, to say how ironic the, the speaker uh, looked. And what you can see is that people are actually pretty good. They're not perfect, but they're kind of good. They, they identify well ironic intonation as ironic, and they identify ironic facial expression as, as, uh, as, um, as ironic. But 
then it's also interesting to look at the details of the results. And um, so what you see here is uh, the, 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 it's, it's the result of the regression for, um, this is for accuracy and this is for reaction times. So what's interesting here is the following. So the intercept is uh, the, the accuracy on, on ironic items. Uh, these, uh, these are logos. What you see is when you have context, Right, so this is the this is for for sorry I should have said that earlier. This is the performance on this task, right? On uh, it's it's the same task I, uh, I I I showed before. It's how people perform neurotypicals on this task. So this is the intercept, and this is the for, this is for the items when there is context. So when there is context, when you know that beforehand that the speaker likes tea and he says that he wants milk. You, 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 you tend to accurately say this is ironic. What's interesting is that when there is facial expression, mock facial expression, actually the accuracy is lower and it's significant, it's, it, it is a significant contrast. So when there is marked facial expression, people actually tend to be less accurate than more accurate. Now, why it's interesting is when you look at, at table six here, it's exactly the same table, but for reaction times. For reaction times, this is the intercept, so it's this is the mean for ironic items. And this is for ironic items where you have marked prosody, and this is for ironic items where you have marked facial expression. What you see is that when you have items when uh, you have marked prosody or marked facial expression, people respond much faster. But Prosody doesn't help accuracy. This is why it's not in this model. And actual facial, facial expression actually leads to lower accuracy. So basically what this shows is that people kind of, they think that they, they are really good at identifying uh, facial expression, what's ironic facial expression, what's ironic intonation. And when you ask them to, when you put them in front of a discrimination task where they have just to decide, is it ironic or not, they kind of good. But when they are in a real life task, right? When they have to, to decide what, what the speaker said, what the speaker wants, what happens is that they, they tend to rely on surface cues, such as prosody or facial expression, instead of trying to engage in contextual reasoning about what the speaker really means but they actually not that good. And that's kind of expected because ironic prosody is something really objectively, really fragile. It's not completely consistent. It's the same thing for facial expression. And um, actually this is something we find this in another paradigm, uh, which I can discuss uh, if um, later, if you're interested. Uh, again, in, that, in this other paper, what we found is that when you put when when you put people in a situation where they can make an ironic uh, a decision about whether someone is ironic or not, without engaging in allocentric perspective taking, they do so even though it they they are less accurate in doing so. So, the conclusion here is rather than some the same kind of pragmatic tasks such as irony detection can be solved with different strategies. And it's it's not it's not really a complex conclusion, but and some of these strategies don't really require engaging in complex perspective taking, and they are much more with they are much shallower. They they don't they don't require, require much cognitive effort, and it's true that autistic individuals may use alternative strategies to perspective taking in in, in some experimental um, settings and, and and in real life, but it. It is also true, I think, um, and uh, other, other evidence in that direction, uh, that neurotypical don't necessarily favor perspective shifting when they don't need to. Um, so really the broad view is, is, is that I think, and it's a shame that Napoleon is, is sick because it's something that I think he's, well, I know he's defending right now, um, uh, is that basically, there are different pragmatic processes of different kinds and some pragmatic processes 
do rely on 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 perspective taken, but pragmatic processes don't necessarily map on types of uh, pragmatic meanings or pragmatic or don't map on some kind of pragmatic typology, irony, indirect speech acts, metaphor, etc. Rather than you, you use different strategies depending on the context, uh, on what's required, and also on individual factors. So I think uh, Manfred asked me to talk for 40 minutes, which, which I did. Uh, so before um, saying, I'm saying, I want to say thank to you again for inviting me, but also obviously to all my team, to, our, to all our funders, and of course to all the peoples and families who uh, take part in our research. Thank you. Thank you very much.